Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to the Wednesday, December 4th meeting of the Board of Trustees for the Utah Transit Authority. We'd uh, like to get started and invite you to stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Our first item up of business is our safety first minute and invite uh, Sheldon Shaw to deliver that for us. Good morning, Chair Trustees. Appreciate the opportunity as always. Um, I want to again today talk about trips, slips, and falls. I know I've talked about that before, but this is a time of year where it becomes concerning because of the weather, and we've had a couple of storms come through already. Um, and what we all can all do to help is that as you come into the main entrances to our buildings, what you'll see is facilities have buckets of ice melt set out. And so the main north entrance here, you'll see that there's a spot with a cup there. And if you come in and you can see there's spots of ice and snow, please help out and try to get that melted. Same thing with the east side over here. There's a bucket there. And even on the west parking lot where we're going to lose the parking lot, there's still there's ice melt over there ready to go. And so please be part of the solution. Thanks. Thank you. Great advice. Um, well, next move uh, to public comment. Uh, Bob, any public comments? Uh, the, we received three over the internet, and those have been provided to you. None in in person today. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll add those to our minutes. Um, uh, next brings us to our consent agenda, which includes approval of some minutes as well as some revisions to some prior actions and uh, clarifications. I move that we approve the consent agenda. I'll second. Uh, we have a motion and a second on the consent agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Thank you. Uh, next is our agency report with our executive director, Carolyn Gunan. Carolyn, good morning. Good morning. Um, first, I'd actually like to just uh, call G.J. Labondi up um, to talk a little bit about bus stops and new wayfinding. We did have a new unveiling and event on um, December 2nd, 2019, um, and just wanted to make sure or last week just to um, give you an update of what's going on. So these handouts. Is this working? Okay. Um, so I'll just be brief. You, what, <clears throat> I'll, I'll explain the, uh, the handout here in a second, but um, this bus stop unveiling was just um, one of many, but many stops that we are going to improve in the future here. This one happens to be in Salt Lake City. It was part of um, the Funding Our Future initiative where the city has de uh, dedicated um, funds to improve several different routes. This one happens to be on the Route 900, or the Route 9, I'm sorry, um, which is one of their, they refer to them as their frequent transit network for the time being. I think we'll actually have a branding group looking at different names for that. And this particular stop with the proximity from the uh, 9 South track station makes uh, those two stops that you have in front of you, two of, two of their busiest stops in the system there. Um, and previously, they did not have ADA accessible pads, which is the before picture that you have there. It was just uh, dirt, dirt, dirt and, um, and weeds. Um, and so with the addition of the new pads, now they're fully accessible and they have the protection of the shelters there. Um, statistics from August 2018 to the 20, August 2019 change day. Uh, the ridership uh, combined... DJ, uh, thank you for your work on this. Um, one question. There we go. No. Oh. It is? Yep, you're yeah. good now. I, okay. I think you're Thank good. you. Sorry. Hopefully somebody heard what I just said. 
Well, no, I, I did. Well, one question I had for you is, um, and I know that Salt Lake City has uh, participated. Would this stop have qualified um, for the shelter, or did they pay for the shelter um, to add to the stop? Based on it the would have qualified plan? for the additional amenities based okay. on the ridership. Okay. The boardings and the lightings are kind of the statistic we look at for those sure. uh, improvements to the amenities. And, and then I love the actual shelter. Is that our standard or is that their standard? That's going to be a standard that we'll use for, um, for instance, during the, all the frequent transit network stops. Okay. Um, we also are just finishing the service choices uh, project where there'll be some dedicated routes that are, that are selected. We expect those. Because we're going to probably enter into partnerships with the cities on some of these routes. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is something to just distinguish them from, from our our standard shelters and I, I missed an opportunity to thank a few people so my team yeah please yeah Marcy Warren and Leo Masick are part of the customer experience team I couldn't have done this without them they were instrumental in you know organizing the the um, installation of the shelters the signs that um, Marcy designed this the drapery <laughs> and and made the made the drapery actually um, oh, wow. But our, yeah, 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 she's pretty, well, yeah. pretty talented. <laughs> Mark is here. Want to wave your hand? Um, and our facilities crew, the road crew, just did stepped up enormously to to just help us get this off the ground. I think Beth, you had a question. I just had a quick question. So the ridership of six hundred percent increase mm -hmm. that occurred between when we first launched that that change. Is that correct? I just correct. want to clarify. Correct. That. Since they since we introduced the new service, the nine. Mm -hmm. Every 15 minutes, that's the increase that we've seen. That is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, so that's that's not even a year's time. No, so. no, it's not a full year yet. Um, but it's, um, I think, in part due to the ease of transfers between that 900 South Track Station and the, and the more frequent service and the accessibility. So it's kind of the... All of those yep. combined. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Any other... That, that's it. Thank you for your time sure. and then your support yesterday, Carlton. Oh, it was great. It, it was, uh, I, I just sort of personally, um, when we, when I, in my service on the city council, we started the redevelopment of this area and, and, uh, also funded, interestingly enough, the track stop there. There was some pessimism about whether the track stop would be successful, but, you know, we were, were willing to fund it and, um, watch that neighborhood uh, develop the way it has and for that track stop to be successful. That's, yeah, you can see the building behind that wasn't there in the previous, in the before picture. Yeah. That's going to be a, a nice asset for that community there. So fun to see. Okay, thank you. Carolyn, anything else? Though? Just one other item. Um, today we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of tracks at City Center Station in Salt Lake City. We sent a uh, uh, email out to all the employees today. They all should be having the pins. I appreciate you wearing your pins today. I have to get mine off my desk. I forgot, <laughs> forgot mine. Um, we also have a media event at 1 p.m. at um, City Center Station today. Uh, just to give you a little update or just a brief timeline, um, is that in December 2001, that's when the red line opened to the University of Utah, just in time for the 2002 Winter Olympics. Um, more than 615,000 people actually road tracks during the games. In September 2003, the red line was extended to the University Medical Center Station. In April 2008, the blue line was extended to Salt Lake Central. In August of 2011, the green line opened to the West Valley and the red line opened to Daybreak. And in April of 2013, the green line opened to the Salt Lake International Airport. So it's been quite a bit of building. And finally, in August of 2013, the blue line was extended to Draper. So been um, a period of you know, less than 15 years, but quite an extensive system, uh, a good ridership. Um, so uh, we are happy to celebrate that today it's for 20 years since the opening. Thank you for that information. Um, with that, I think that takes us to item seven in our financial report from October 2019. Bob, good morning. Good morning. We'll look at the October financial statements today. If I can, there we go. Uh, here's the dashboard. A couple of things to note there on the right side, year to date, all the circles are green. 
except for ridership, which uh, it's yellow, but note that the ridership is up slightly from the same period through October a year ago. So again, we're fighting the trend. Some of the things that we've done has helped us maintain ridership. And as you just heard about some of the areas, it's been pretty astounding, the increases from the changes we've made. As far as uh, sales tax, those lines uh, at the bottom are at right about 3.9%. And so we've gone through that period of decline from those months where we had the high uh, growth last year. And now we're into a period where the growth rates for the last part of 2018 were in the 3 to 4% range. So I expect this will level out and maybe even start to increase just a little bit as we get through into those periods now. So Bob, on this graph is the line, I guess, where we budgeted at? That's our long-term historical 5% growth. Okay. And so we're just measuring the six-month moving average and the 12-month moving averages growth rates compared to that long-term uh, historical growth rate. Okay. As far as fair revenue, you can see we're just right on top of what we've budgeted year to date. Uh, expenses are about 9.6 million under what we had estimated through October. And the diesel price you'll notice in October actually went up. That had been around $2. And so we're up to 224. For November, it's actually 263. So for that one month, we've jumped up above the 250. Uh, at the end of October, it was 206 was the average for the 10 months. For November, it's going to be 212 when we come and report the November numbers. So we're at that point in the year where you can have a significant variance in one month, but it doesn't have a large effect on the year to date. So many of the savings are locked in for the year when it comes to fuel. Questions on this before we move on to taking a closer look at sales tax? Ah, oh, it's on, on the, the side. side yeah. Okay, let's try that. Ah, there we go. So here's sales tax collections. Uh, they're up a little bit from what you saw in the September presentation. For November, they're going to be down just a little bit. Uh, the overall here is 3.9% with the November sales tax collections that went down to 3.5%. And the major impact's really going to be in Salt Lake City. You can see here they were at 2.7%. November, they went down to about 2.2%. Most of the other ones stayed where they're at or actually increased in November. So we just need to get Salt Lake people to spend more money and, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's a quick look at sales tax. Uh, you remember last month we looked at the super uh, centers and provided a little more data there. Looking at the expense side, uh, we continue to see significant savings on the administration. A couple of the leaders there, risk management, and you remember we talked a month or two ago about a significant collection that they had that makes up about half of their $2 million savings. Uh, IT is about $1.3 million under budget right now. Uh, legal, $685,000. The executive director, about $660,000. And the board, $314,000. When you look at operations support, asset management makes up about half of that. They're 731000 under budget, and then customer service is 317000 under budget. Air transit, 850000 Most of that's in mobility manage management. That's about 600000 MOW is uh, right on budget, but... There's swings within that. Wages and benefits, they're under budget, about 530000 on uh, transfer to capital, and parts make up about 400000 where they're over. Light rail, uh, there's... Can I ask a question on the maintenance away? 
So I'm a delay group. I, mean, I would think that that would be pretty consistent. Have they just had a harder time filling positions? Or? They've been having trouble filling all the positions. Okay. And so we've had several vacancies throughout the year. Okay. On light rail, uh, wages and benefits were over budget, about 736,000. Parts are over by 122, but that's mainly offset by everything else, about $730,000 favorable. So they're over in some areas and unders in other areas. The net is they're still under budget. Bus, the most significant, I'm sorry, skip commuter rail. A commuter rail, most significant savings there is diesel fuel. That's about $800,000. Uh, they've got savings in some other areas. Parts, they're over about $340,000. That's been a common theme on the parts and uh, we've hoped to address that in the 2020 budget that we've increased some of the parts expense oops i'm sorry as far as bus uh, the main uh, savings there's on the maintenance side which would be the diesel fuel uh, the operations are actually over budget just to about five hundred thousand, whereas maintenance is under budget about 1.8 million Looking at by line item, uh, wages and benefits were over budget a bit on that. Regular wages are under by 2.8 million, but that's offset by overtime and some non-operator wages and some leave time. Uh, so we just have an offset there. As far as services, uh, some of the same groups, you've got IT about a million to legal 600,000, Mobility management, about half a million. Fuel savings, diesels, two and a half million dollars through the end of October. CNG, about 200,000. And all of our other fuels, about 300,000. So we have a variety there. Gasoline, we're almost right on top of the projection. We're just $17,000 under budget. Parts. Uh, we still see this net uh, where we talked about parts. We've been buying lots of parts to maintain, maintain our vehicles. Uh, so we're about a million over on parts. Uh, warranty were helpful, about $200,000 to get that net of about 800000 And then heading to the other category, purchase transportation, we're about a million and a half dollars under budget through October. Uh, insurance again helps that two million dollars, and then the other large one is contingency. We're about nine hundred thousand uh, under budget under budget through October. Bob, can I ask a question? Sure. On the utilities portion of that, it does that include our electric buses, or is that not yet calculated? Because I know it's October. So it includes telephone. Non oh, that's the type of electricity. Non propulsion. Okay, so yeah, non propulsion fuel. power and then heat, light, water. Okay. So the propulsion part actually shows up in the maintenance areas. Okay. Any questions? Uh, yeah, turn to colleagues, any questions? That's helpful, thank you, Bob, for that mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> I don't think that was information only. That takes us to contracts and uh, disbursements and grants. And our first item up is a change order on our ADA paratransit service contract uh, extension with MV Public Transportation. Eddie? And Good morning. I have Cheryl Beveridge with me this morning. Welcome, Cheryl. So as you mentioned, this is with MV Public Transportation. This is change order number six to our existing contract with MV Public Transportation. MV uh, Public Transportation Incorporated is a contractor who provides paratransit and route deviation services in Weber, Davis, and Box Elder Counties. This change order amount is $1,710,000, bringing the total contract amount to $13,989,881. The original contract was effective uh, September 1st, 2014 through August 31st, 2016, and has had three one-year extensions on this particular contract. Latest extension expired on October 31st, 2019, 
This change will extend the contract for six months to April 30th, 2020 to allow for issuance of an RFP and negotiation of a new contract. This extension will ensure continuous paratransit and route deviation services under the current provider uh, through August, uh, or sorry, April 30th, 2020. Any questions? One question I had for you, or uh, you, Eddie, or Cheryl, and, and you may or may not know this answer. Um, I'm guessing in the case of United Way, which is our next item, I mean, they're a local uh, nonprofit, and this, they, for whatever reason, they kind of got into this business at some point in their existence. Does MV do other service um, here locally, or are they just a national company and they, they, they came here as, as a result of their contract? Uh, I just wonder, like, are there, how many other providers are out there that do this kind of service? Right. So there's several. MV is a national company, and they they just bid on the contract, and then they come in and, and take over. And there's several organizations out there like that in the transit industry. Okay. Originally, there was a, a nonprofit that provided this service up in the northern area. It was called Handy Trans. Um, but they were not awarded the contract. Um, MV was awarded the contract. Okay. Questions on the extension? Seeing that I would entertain a motion. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the uh, extension for the ADA paratransit services contract with MV Public Transportation. Second. Motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, motion passes. That brings us to item B, which I imagine is somewhat similar. This will sound very, very similar. <laughs> this is change order number four for existing contract with United Way of Utah County. United Way of Utah County is a contractor who provides our paratransit services in Utah County. This change order amount is $800,000, bringing the total contract amount to $8,303,310. Original contract was effective September 1, 2015 through August 31st, 2016, and, had, and has had three one-year extensions. Uh, latest extension expired on October 31st, 2019. This change, similar to the previous, uh, will extend the contract for six months to April 30th, 2020, to allow for issuance of an RFP and negotiation of a new contract. This extension will ensure continuous paratransit services under the current provider through April 30th, 2020. Any questions from the board? Well, I guess I have uh, one question. Are you anticipating that that uh, with both of these contracts coming due at the end of April, that uh, we'll get a bid by somebody that will cover both areas? Or are you still anticipating uh, the poss possibility or probability that, that we'll have two companies, one up north and one in Utah County? Either or could happen. Okay. Can I ask you a question, and I'm, this is just for both contracts in general. Um, when you're doing these types of contracts or when you're doing these RFPs, excuse me, to get to this, this certain type of service, what, um, what parameters are you looking at? Do you have parameters for, like, the service levels, um, cost increases, and everything else that's included in that? And is it based on transportation dollars or, or no, sorry, uh, cost per mile? Um, so... We have, in this contract, we have uh, a stipulation that we are asking for them to include the cost, um, the, the um, dispatch, the cost, they're, they're, we're proposing two different um, reimbursement rates. So we want them to cost it um, for them providing dispatching and for us providing dispatching. We also want them to provide their, um, their wage structure, because that's been a problem for us in them hiring appropriately. Um, and um, and we will pay them by the hour. Both areas, we will pay them by the hour. So um, they will have an overhead cost, and then they will have an hourly rate that they will submit in the proposal. Okay. Thank you. Cheryl, do you think you could um, just give a sense of ridership, paratransit ridership in each of the regions? So UTA provides about 65% of the rides. Um, and then as we separate the rest of that out, <clears throat> United is that, is that in, just in, in Salt, Salt Lake County? Okay. 
Um, United Way provides about 300 rides a day, um, and we've seen that shift since um, um, Mobility Management is now providing some of the transportation down there with the free service that they're providing. So we've seen some reductions. Um, we used to provide about, Paratransit used to provide about 500 rides a day, and um, MV provides about 800 rides a day. Any other questions? I would entertain a, a motion on this. I move that we approve the AD services contract extension for United Way of Utah County. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. Um, and good luck in the procurement efforts. So, uh, an important service. Our next item up is a change order for on-call maintenance, uh, task order number 92 for on-route bus ch uh, charging equipment uh, for phase two with Stacy and Whitbeck. Um, Mary Delaretto is with us. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, this item is for uh, approval of a task order for Stacy and Whitbeck to install the charging equipment at the central, central station here for our we, we actually received two loan grants from FTA. The first one was for the five electric buses and the charger, what served the University of Utah. And we installed a charger at the central station. Stacy Whitbeck did that construction for us, and they know the site conditions there. And this second grant is through Park City. We're a subrecipient for two more electric buses to serve the Park City Connect. And as part of that project, we also are installing a second high power charger at the at the central station and so this is for uh, Stacy since they know the site conditions to go in there and install that we did receive a five hundred thousand dollar grant from Rocky Mountain Power which they would want us to expend all those expenses before the end of the year so this would help us get that done and get that grant so the second charger is also here it's all like central, it, it, not up in Park correct. City. Correct. It'll be here as but well. It services Park City buses, I guess. It will service the two Connector. Park City Connect buses, buses, yeah. And they have a charger up there okay. to help. Okay. Questions from the board? This is just an interesting question. I know they have uh, uh, Proterra buses, so the charging mechanisms themselves are interchangeable. Um, we we will whatever bus we decide to pick will be interchangeable with the charging yeah okay thanks if there are no other questions i move that we approve the on-call maintenance task force number 92 for the uh, bus charging unit and equipment to be placed at uh, salt lake central second i have a motion and a second to approve this particular change order all in favor say aye Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion passes. Thank you, Mary. I think you're still here for. Yeah, and to Alma tell has us about to, a grand is going to join me here for any detailed questions. Okay. So um, every year, Wasa Trent Regional Council has a call for applications for their CMAC, STP, and TAP funds. Um, the CMAC and STP funds are 2026 funds that we would be applying for this year. And the TAP funds are for 2021. Sometimes they can move those funds forward. And if we are awarded, we do have pre-award authority. If we want to do a project before those funds are available, then we get reimbursed when, in, right, when they become available. So there are five projects that we want to submit for this year. Um, this, this is just for the Ogden-Layton urbanized area. Next week, you'll see another will come again here with a request for, I believe it's five more projects for the Salt Lake West Valley area. And the first one is for um, operating funds for the first three years of the BRT project, similar to what we're doing down at UVX. The second one is for construction of a roundabout on Weber State University campus, which will help our buses and the local match for that would be paid for by Weber State University. Ogden City is in support of this project as well. And that's part of the uh, proposed uh, BRT system that would it, it go around would, Weber State? It's not being constructed as part of that project, but it would help facilitate okay. all our bus routes going through okay. that area. 
Uh, the third one is for on route electric bus charging infrastructure, which would be used if we have if we decide, which sounds like we're going to do electric buses for the Ogden BRT project. This would help fund uh, an additional charger. Um, bus stop improvements service area wide is the fourth request. And then the fifth one is we have a project budgeted for our mobile device, mobile data devices on all our buses, I believe. It's just the buses. Is it also the tracks? And that is about a $5 million project that we have in our budget spread out over the next several years. And this would be to get um, federal funds to help pay some of that project. One question I had for you, Mary. Um, so, uh, so, so basically, do we just have a in essence, a re if we go forward with these projects after they're um, approved in a, kind of a longer range funding plan on, on on the MPO side, you basically just have a receivable that's out there for two or three or four years until the funds actually become available. Yeah. For instance, we were awarded ski bus funds, which we bought the buses several years ago, and as the funds became available the past two years we re we were reimbursed for no. purchasing those buses we don't I don't imagine we get any interest uh, uh, no. value <laughs> <of that. laughs> it's worth asking <laughs> so so this is for information but the process is they won't this goes into the competitive process and then the selection will be what what is the time frame for the CMAC? I think it's in the STP May Time frame, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's correct. It's in the early year. They start reviewing all of the projects with the uh, different committees. It goes through the technical advisory committee to Transcom, and they make a recommendation to Transcom, and then Transcom makes a recommendation to the whole WFRC board. Uh, there's usually not much variation between what the technical advisory committee recommends and what the WFRC board ends up approving. So we'll have a fairly good idea. I, I'm thinking it's around the March time frame technical advisory committee decides and then it's a few months later that it's through all of the other committees I had a question um, specifically in regards to the bus stops um, I it's about it says it's a construct upgrade 15 or more do we um, when we're dealing with those various communities I'm assuming it's within the whole Ogden Layton area do they have any impact input on bus shelters and design wise is that part of that or is it pretty standardized and that's how we do it and not like city paid extra basically i guess is my question uh, they certainly have input uh, andreas and uh, trevin blaisdell have been working with communities up there already on the bus stop improvements we've done with other funding this would be similar we work together with them you know gj was talking about bus stop improvements they all work together with the communities on where they're going and our bus stop master plan helps inform where those stops will be improved. But we work with the community on installing them, on getting right-of-way, because most of them are in the community's street right-of-ways and such. So there, there is coordination that occurs. Thank you. And I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I've been up to Ogden and Weber State very recently, and there's a lot of excitement. And so it's good to see these types of uh, applications going through for this. So thank you. Any other questions on this grant? proposal. We'll look forward to the part two uh, for the Salt Lake area as well. So thank you. Um, that brings us to uh, <coughs> service and fare approvals. And first item up is a sponsored fare agreement with Ogden City for the Ogden Trolley or Route 601 Circulator Bus Service, Monaco. Good morning, yes. Andreas, welcome. Good morning. We're happy to be here discussing more about some service contracts. So the first one, um, Ogden City, Route 601, the amount $72,000. This is a contract that will be calculated by recovering revenue, 25% uh, of operating costs. And based upon our, our relationship with the city and the terms of this contract, I do suggest that we renew it for another year and at this price point. Are there any questions that Andreas or I can answer for you on this one? Andreas, are they um, seeing uh, ridership where they projected or anticipated? Or so, so we are quite excited about the ridership on the Route 601. Uh, it's doing fairly well. Um, 
My apologies. I'm just looking at my ridership notes no, no, here. Um, since memo, August, I... since August of 2019, when this route was created, uh, we've had 11,000 riders. Um, we don't have a baseline to measure it against. It's an entirely new route, but but we 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 are quite excited and happy with the results it's had so far. Ridership has grown every month. Um, interestingly, ridership on Saturdays is higher than weekdays, which means that. People are coming in to visit Ogden and, and using the trolley, um, which is one of the reasons for this route. So it's meeting its purpose and doing well. Are the daytime riders just workers that work in the downtown? So area? we have, we've been out serving riders uh, quite a bit. And so there's workers that ride it, there's tourists that ride it, um, and, and there's people who just stumble upon a, a bus stop and think this is cool and they ride it. There's entire families. <laughs> That go out and ride it because of the novelty of it being a trolley bus. Yeah, sure. um, yeah, and and people staying at the downtown Ogden area hotels uh, ride it to to get around the city. Yeah. Any questions on this particular one? No, I just want to make a comment. I think Ogden City is really excited. They're even like talking about expanding it if there's a possibility someday to get to the Raptors. Right. Isn't that correct? It's correct. The Raptors yeah. Stadium. So. I think they're they're seeing a lot of positive about that as well. So thank you for your efforts. Um, with that, I'd like to make a motion, if I may, um, to approve the sponsored fare agreement with Ogden City for the Ogden Trolley, the Route 601. Second. A motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> that motion passes. Thank you. That brings us to our uh, second or uh, item B, sponsored fare agreement with Layton City. Uh, corporation for their Midtown Trolley Route 628, Monica? Yes, so this will be from service uh, between Layton and Clearfield Front Runner Stations. Again, no fare will be collected. The contract amount is $159,000 calculated, again, by recovering revenue for 25% of the operating costs. And again, based on our relationship with the city, um, I suggest we renew this contract and pricing for another year. And just a similar question, how do, how, do you Absolutely. have a sense of how ridership is? Yes, so ridership on this route is growing. Uh, in the last 12 months, we've had 128,000 riders. Mm -hmm. wow. uh, that's up 14% over the previous 12-month period. Uh, we've we've extended the route a little bit, uh, so it goes to the Leighton IHC Hospital, and we're seeing some, some increased ridership there. Um, so we're quite excited about this route and how it continues to grow as well. Any other questions? No, but there is a competition between Farmington and Layton, just so you know. And uh, Layton is very proud to say they were the first one to get the trolley. Right. So, yes, and so that, that's well done. Um, with that, I'd like to make a motion that we approve, <clears throat> excuse me, the sponsored fare agreement with Layton City um, for the Midtown Trolley, the Route 628. I'll second that. A motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? A motion passes. Thank you both. And I think, Monica, you don't, oh, I guess you both get to deal with item C, which is a ski bus agreement, uh, primarily in the northern Utah, northern Utah area. Correct. So these are our ski resorts up in Ogden. We have Powder Mountain, Snow Basin, Davis County, and Morgan County. And we'd like approval for these contracts so that we can begin service with the ski resorts. And I assume, uh, and maybe hopefully by spring or something, ultimately what is the thought that our, all of our ski bus agreements would have kind of similar kind of pricing strategy? Or, yes, yeah, so or we're going to start looking at pricing now. We have a lot of data from prior years that we can use. We'll continue to use data, and we do get it monthly, but the goal is to revisit all of the contracts like we mentioned in a prior meeting. Any questions, however, from the board? Do you have ridership numbers? For Absolutely, yes. Okay, <laughs> lay, it, lay it out here, Andres. So uh, our Route 677, which is our newest ski route, goes from Layton Front Runner Station to Snow Basin. Uh, that had about 10,500 boardings uh, last ski season. That was up 83% over the prior season, so that route is growing fast. Um, and, and we are struggling to keep up with the ridership. We have packed buses. Uh, our partners at uh, the resort and Davis County are quite interested in increased 
ski service on that route. That's something we agreed to discuss after this season is over. Um, our second ski route I'm going to speak about, this goes from downtown Ogden to Powder Mountain. Um, we had 34,500 boardings last season. That, again, is up in the 80% ball range from the previous uh, season. Uh, and the third route goes from Ogden to Snow Basin. That route stayed pretty level. We didn't see a significant increase. Uh, it was, uh, I think, 1.5% increase of riders. And mainly, I think, because a lot of the people that used to use that route are now taking it from latent stations. So the growth amongst uh, the growth in general to Snow Basin um, was significant, but mostly was on the Davis County route. Could I just ask you, what's the frequency of that, uh, the route from the uh, Front Runner Station in Layton? The one from Layton, we have two trips in the morning and two trips in the afternoon. Well, actually, we added a third trip down in the afternoon. So you have two trips up in the morning, um, and they're staggered about an hour apart. Mm -hmm. And then we have three trips down, one in the midday and two in the late, late afternoon. Later. Is that every day? That is every day, yes. Okay. Uh, so it, the service runs every day. We have peak ski service, which is on holidays, weekends, and all of December. And what we do on those days is we double head buses. We run two buses back to back on each one of those trips just because of the capacity we need. And, and you just call, even though there are two buses, you just call that one trip. Right. But on this public schedule, it's highlighted as having okay. that peak service so people know there, there's added capacity. Okay. So that they don't think that they can't get on, right? right? Thank you. And did you end up doing similar kinds of things to your ski racks that this uh, that uh, the Meadowbrook facility did? Or we have so not. Um, we all our ski buses, our newer ski buses, uh, and the ski racks inside the bus function quite well. Okay. We padded them so that uh, our skiers' uh, equipment doesn't get damaged and and it seems to work well for for our customer base in the future if there's a need for capacity and more seating then that would be something we would definitely be looking at okay. any other questions on this particular one if not i would entertain a motion on this I, I move that we agree we uh, approve the uh, ski bus agreement for the 2019 2020 winter season for ogden layton Clearfield, Parts North, <laughs> as as uh, presented. I will second that. I think there'll be a lot of other communities that be, might be excited, so we'll, but I'll second that. I have a motion and a second on this agreement. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Thank you. That um, brings us to item D, which is a discount ski bus pass agreement with Visit Ogden for the 2019-20 winter season yeah visit Ogden so they um, distribute day passes for us to the Weber County hotels and this is often utilized by visitors that do want to use the ski bus to get up and down it's a simple way for them to get a day pass and so we're asking that you approve this contract as well so that visit Ogden can continue to help us in distributing uh, those passes to riders so this is a 20% discount. It is. It's We're billing them $7.20 for every uh, pass that they sell, and these are electronic cards. Okay. And I assume then, then they carry all the administrative costs associated with they do. pass distribution. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Uh, oh, it, seeing none, I would entertain a motion on this agreement. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we approve the discount ski bus pass agreement with Visit Ogden for the 2019-2020 winter season. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Okay, I think that Great. gets Thank you, you done for the day. Thank you both. Um, our uh, next item up is our uh, discussion item in regards to... Uh, information or excuse me a customer service report and i nicole and uh, cindy edford are going to join us and welcome both there we go
So, well, thank you, trustees. Um, as you know, I'm Nicole Bordeaux. I'm the Chief Communications Marketing Officer here at UTA, and under me is uh, Customer Service. And so today, uh, Cindy and I are here to present just the report on Customer Service and kind of go over um, our KPIs and our responsibility and the group that we uh, work with here at UTA. So um, as you know, we have 45 employees under uh, customer service, it's quite a large group here. And there's six areas of responsibility. So uh, we'll be discussing our contact center for information, that's what they, uh, the agents that do our writer information and they do our education. We have a customer focus um, group that does our feedback and support with issues and you see this this picture of some of the, some of our agents, so we put that up there for you to kind of see the great group. And I think you've had a chance to visit over at Meadowbrook, uh, some of our team. We have our customer relations specialists. Uh, that's a group that does our fair media sales and writer information. And then item recovery specialists, and that's our lost and found group, uh, as well as our hearing officer and finds adjudication team and that's who does our citations and takes that information in and helps with our fares uh, group as well. And then we have our customer communications and social media specialists and that's the one I always jumble up their names <laughs> because we've changed. Um, but that group does our both our internal and external communications about rail incidents and thanks to you they're also doing our bus detours and our snow routing. So um, I'm going to turn the time over, Cindy, over to Cindy and she's going to go over kind of what each group does, their goals, their KPIs, um, some of the continuous improvement items that we're looking at, um, and then, at the, you know, ask us teams and just kind of dive into what we do um, in this group, and then let us know if there's additional questions that you have or anything that we can, uh, more information we can give you. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I am Cindy Medford. I have met a few of you. Um, it'd be great to have you come over and visit. I may start talking too fast because I get excited about talking about my team and what work they do, so I'll try not to talk too fast. So we're starting with our contact information center. Um, I do want to point out that um, about 10 years ago, we were taking a million calls a day. Um, but with all the technology and innovation we're doing, I'm sorry, a, a year. A million calls a year. <laughs> CMR yeah, a year. Jumping ahead. A year. <laughs> it felt like a million calls a day. We had more people at we had a lot more people yeah. then, um, but with technology, the calls are dropping, and we're only taking about 250,000 a year, And um, but the calls are longer. They used to be 86 seconds. Now they're only 100, or they're 139 seconds per call. In call center, you measure everything by seconds, by the way, not minutes, um, because the calls are longer. More self, the help of how can I get, plan a full trip, you know, what do I, the longer questions. Is all of the next bus and where's my bus questions are answered by technology. Um, our customers are only waiting on average about 19 seconds in hold for information. The goals and KPIs, this is year to date. Um, so our goal is to answer 80% of the calls within 20 seconds. And we're currently in this team at 81% of our calls are answered in 20 seconds. We try to keep our abandon level between three and 6% and we're at five. And our quality assurance goal is 90% or higher. Now, quality assurance means we pull um, one call per agent per week, which is kind of higher than industry standard. And we make sure they give the company name, their name, they repeat the address, they ask for confirmation. A lot of things they have to do in those calls, and we check those. And we're currently at 95% on this team. All right, customer focus. This is the team that takes the customer feedback and complaints and commendations. You're going to, um, we get lots of commendations also. This team is taking 36,000 calls a year. It slowly goes up um, every year just a little bit. Um, we do receive 4,000, almost 5,000 of those um, via email that come in, the comments that come in. This talk time is a lot longer. It is nine minutes, but they have to ask a lot of questions, date, time, direction, location, what did, were you trying to catch, then they investigate, um, you know, what's going on. We have a lot of tools to investigate. We also do fair refunds for fair pay or if the card balance isn't correct, um, troubleshooting for go ride. So we, ha we have a lot of stuff we're responsible for helping customers figure things out. 
Um, the average wait time on this team for customers, their average wait is about 43 seconds. Um, if there's an event that, you know, is going on like Friday after Christmas, we were all really busy with all of the snow and snow routing and the canyons closing. Thanksgiving. Oh, Thanksgiving. <laughs> That's okay. Thanksgiving. Come on the next holiday. Um, Thanksgiving. So this team has, um, their goal is a little bit different. It is 70% of the calls answered in 40 seconds. And they're at 79%. Um, we try to keep their abandon level below 19 and they're doing a great job. They're only at 7% abandon and that means the customer's holding too long and they don't want to hold. Um, some people won't hold at all. As soon as they get the hold message, they'll hang up and call back. Um, quality assurance, once again, for the, this team um, is 94%. The customer communications and social media specialist team, they're the ones that are doing the, the Twitter notifications, the bus is late, answering those back and forth questions the customers have. And they, this team tweets out about 25 tweets a day, okay? This is not, this does not count the conversation back and forth um, tweets, just the, uh, you know, announcement that we have a late train or that we have a bus on snow route. They do the internal emails if you're on that group. They notify people every 10 minutes um, during an event to keep us updated so we can also tell customers on the phone what's going on. And they also do the signs on the rail station saying that if their delay is more than 10 minutes, we update and say there's going to be a delay. And then you heard about the new transit app. If you haven't already downloaded it, it allows people to see their routes. And we've got detours on those. And then we have a brand new program coming out called Gov Delivery, where we will allow customers to sign up or by text message or email and receive those same alerts for their for their own routes. We're very, very excited about that. Well, I'm going to stop you. And it may be more than just uh, alerts on detour snowing, oh. snow so, routing. So for my team, it'll be um, the alerts of snow routing, um, bus detours. Right now, we only give detours um, for long term or the full day. If, if a water line breaks in the middle of the day and the bus can't go down that street, the customer is going to have to find out when they go down that street. With this system, we'll be able to, as long as they're signed up, either receive a text and or an email and we'll tell them your bus is on detour because of a water line break. And then when it comes, when they get it fixed and we're able to go back down that street, it'll be, um, it's back on regular routing. We'll also be able to communicate, and this will probably be the marketing group that does this, but they'll be communicating newsletters, um, other announcements. So this really broadens our communication with our public. I'm really excited. This is about a game this. changer for us. It is. Yeah. It's really exciting. And on the marketing side, is that something they, Kind of self-select or sign up? Yes, it is a self-selection right now. Or a self-opt out. Yeah. So we're working through those pieces right now. Yeah. Is it pretty easy to do that? Is, is the average rider going to be able to know oh. if they're on that transit app that they can just simply sign that up? That comes up pretty quick. It's really easy. I've done it. <laughs> so you can, on your route, it's like, do you want alerts for this route? It actually will prompt you to you use the two. Would you like alerts to know when this notifications so it's pretty simple mm -hmm. and the um, gov delivery will be on our website you'll just sign up and you can even text in to sign up for your route there'll be lots of ways for people to sign up the nice thing about text is if you don't have a smartphone you can still get alerts you don't have to have a smartphone in order to get alerts about delays and detours and events happening at UTA if you choose to so our customer relations specialists, they're the agents that work at the customer service centers. There are four customer service centers at UTA, one in Ogden, one in Timp Timpanogos, um, and two in Salt Lake, one over here at Salt Lake Central Station, and then the Meadowbrook campus, we still have an agent that works there. And those offices, all those offices are open from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, and they help customers with information, they sell our fair media, and then they support and, and deal with lost and found, because the lost and found is stored there. They can help customers retrieve their items. Lost and found team. Um, in some areas, it's the same person like in Ogden and Temp. They split the duties of picking it up. In Salt Lake, it's a little bit different. Um, we have 16 different locations we have to pick up. It takes us five hours just to gather lost and found every day. Um, we are collecting 21,000 items a year on average. Their call, or sorry, 21,000 calls, we're going to talk about how many items we actually get, which is higher than, a little bit higher, well, it's about the same. Average talk time for this team is about two minutes. They do have to ask some questions and look in our database that we, we document everything in and, you know, look for a match. And sometimes they have to go back and actually look in the bin to make sure it matches the customer's description. 
the customers are waiting about 64 seconds, um, but we don't receive as many calls on this team. So that's um, um, a little bit different for this team. As you'll know, the KPIs and goals for this team um, have some red marks. We do have some areas we're working on right now. 80% of the calls in 20 seconds, and we're only at 69%. So that means customers are holding longer than we'd like them, and we're not answering as quickly as we'd like. Our abandon level is actually all the, is at 10%, which is higher than we want it to be, which comes back to making sure we're available and um, maybe finding better ways to answer those calls faster and get information back to customers. Um, however, when we do talk to a customer, our quality, per, our quality for those calls is at 92 so um, we're finding about 1,500 items a month. It's 18,000 a year on average. Um, unfortunately, only about 19% of the customers contact us and get their items back. So we have a lot of items that we donate um, to charities. Um, if it's not usable, we do destroy it. What, what are the items that you generally get? Oh, don't even get me started. We used to I, say well, every, I, I can everything imagine at, from A to Z. But. We used to say everything in the kitchen sink, and then we actually got, got a, kitchen a kitchen sink. sink. Okay. Yep. Yep. So. We got some really nice kitchen sinks a few years ago. We've had every instrument you need in an orchestra. Um, washer. Oh, wow. we, we received a dishwasher once. Um, <laughs> a dishwasher? Vacuum cleaners. Yeah. Somebody was mostly moving. Mostly clothing, though, is oh. what you usually Yeah, this have. time of year, a lot of gloves, hats, and coats, which, if they're not claimed, you're you know, definitely donated over to the, the homeless shelters for reuse. So, so and just a question so we have that designated so it's it we go to whichever homeless shelter and donate that and that's kind of the structure or does it vary throughout the entire um, the number of customer service areas that you have how does that work so it does vary because in Utah County they're going to donate to a homeless shelter in that area in Ogden it's going to be up in Ogden um, like the Lions Club takes the glasses and you know the prescription glasses that are they we just give them all of the glasses um, a lot of the places will just come to us, like the homeless shelter will actually pick up from us. Um, one of the things we get is bikes. We get so many bikes in Lost and Found, which we have the police run through the database for stolen bikes. And we've never had one come up in that database, but we receive so many bikes that people are like, stop, no more bikes, we can't take anymore. So we're, we do rotate that between um, the Bike Collective and the Boys and Girls Club. And um, so we reach out. So anybody who's interested in being added to that list can contact us. And as you see at the end of this, we're looking at updating the UTA policy and SOPs as we're processing this so we can make sure that those are part of the SOPs of where the, the donation places are and, and making sure that we're consistent through all of our agencies and, and, and our um, and our um, service units so that we... How, how long do you generally hold things before you donate them? So items are held according to state ordinance by for 30 days. And we are going to be increasing um, specific items of certain value. <clears throat> I apologize for, of certain value up to 90 days. Okay. Which means we need to reorganize our space a little bit to hold items because 18,000 items is a lot. So that's mostly the, the, the bikes and those bigger. Yeah, items. we have a huge bike rack. If you haven't had a chance already, swing in over to the Lost and Found office and ask for a tour. Right. And they'll show you all the bikes and the bins. We try to keep organized to try to make sure customers were able to get it back to customer quickly and easily. So the hearing officer um, and does fines adjudication, and so anything that is a civil citation um, that a customer wants to um, protest, they have 30 days to protest their, their citation, and the hearing officer handles that. If they're not protesting because they, you know, did agree that their citation was issued because they were, you know, in violation of maybe fair or parking, the, they can come into our, call or come into our customer service center over here at the Salt Lake office, and they can make, pay, make payment arrangements um, to pay their citation. We also do um, different things for people who maybe don't have the money to afford it. We offer payment arrangements. We have a, a safety video class that they can take and get a reduced fine. And we ultimately, our goal is not to make money off of people off citations. Our goal is to educate and to um, add to our um, paying riders. We want them to be paying riders when they ride our service. So we're trying to educate them and find circumstances to support them with their payment options. And I would agree, Cindy. How do you deal with sort of, and I, in, in the past in my other service, I, if somebody was genuinely trying to remedy it, you know, 
you want to definitely work with them, but you have those that sort of habitually abuse them, and you probably have, can quote some of those names by <laughs> memory, or those folks could. I mean, are there ways in which we say, okay, if you're going to be a jerk ongoingly, <laughs> on an ongoing basis, is there some ways that we sort of, or is our compliance ratio great, and this is 2% of the population. I just wonder if you... Let me jump to the discussions. next slide. That might have answer some of those questions for okay. you. So in 2018, um, civil citations um, that were collectible, first of all, not warnings, because warnings are just um, a warning. So civil citations that were issued was 5,290, which has a value of 494,000. Now it has a value of 494,000. However, 100, or 1,552 of those are usually homeless or extreme, extreme low income, and they don't have the financial ability to pay for those. So we would accept um, community service in exchange um, for that type of situation. And then you, see, you can see how many are still open at this point when this report was pulled, which was back at the end of October. So as of November 1st, this is the numbers. Because people can still pay them. They're open, but they can still pay them. We don't just um, eliminate them at the end of the year. Um, possible collection, that 2,895, we don't know what the customer's circumstances are. Um, we don't know if it's um, collectible or not collectible. The uncollectible are, like they have their address is the, is the road home. So we know that trying to collect from that particular group is going to be very difficult. And then the closed ones are the ones people have actually come in and paid or done their community service and um, the value and the money made in those areas. And then I do have night 2019s up to date. So, so do we, I mean, and maybe, is there any value in turning them over to, at some point to a collection agency? So when this um, position was turned over to me back in, I think 2016, 2016, yeah. 2016 yeah. Um, I looked at some different collection agencies and they were not interested because I'm not sure what the, how, you know, the collection process and how much they would make each person, but they felt it wasn't enough we actually money went, for their We time. actually went to an RFP, and the percentage of a collectible wasn't enough for them to actually make money on. on yeah, even on. using the state collections, and we did approach mm -hmm. um, the AG's office about um, going state through tax. their system. Yeah. They felt like it's not, it, it doesn't give them a rate of return. What, to what get would these. be sort of the average amount? Um, citations average a hundred. Hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Hundred dollars. If you take the safety class, and um, it's reduced to forty dollars, and it's online, you can take it online. It's really convenient. You can also pay online. We try to make it as convenient as possible sure. for our customers. I mean, so you have an average, but do you ever have somebody who has like ten citations? And... Yeah. So. Um, Especially during the winter months, you'll have people who don't have fare who get on and use the trains to stay warm, and they will get citations, so they'll have um, more than others. So one thing about customer service is I have numbers about everything, so um, we're able to show how many people you know have more than one, how much they owe. Um, there could be an opportunity, um, Chair, to work with maybe the road home used to have a um uh, a judge and i can't think judge of it baxter. Judge judge baxter, baxter. With, yeah. right to see if there's some way to work through that to get these cleared up again we wouldn't our funds probably wouldn't increase but yeah. if there's a way that we could work with chief to maybe get some more community service or cleanup or some kind of community engagement piece on that um, we could probably clean up some of those or even one, but that's only in Salt Lake. And one of the things is we go region, right? We have a huge region. And so it's a little bit harder, even probably for our officers, to expand that kind of service throughout our, our the Wasatch Front. So I, it, it- I was just even thinking in the possible collection. I mean, I it would be really, it's really hard even for Judge Baxter to sometimes get enforcement on the homeless, but- um, but on the possible collection, and I wondered, like, you know, and it might just be a small percentage, but if you have somebody who's got multiple $100 citations, at that point, could you go to the state collections and say, 
we've we've asked he's kind we of asked we could ask again we can reach out to them Let's again to just some numbers and see if because it has been a couple of years since we've reached out to them for a solution are you okay support. if i ask the chief a question here? oh go ahead um chief do you want to come forward and You're welcome to sit or yeah. no, I, um, that's all right. We've been through the, the whole, this whole, collection. you may have to turn the mic on. Okay, thank you. Cindy, I had a question. Yes. So in 2018, you still had open, uncollectible, and possible collection. Mm -hmm. What defines possible collection versus open? So this information, that um, this particular view of this information is pulled and separated by addresses. So if we, when the citation is written, it goes into the system, the lines adjudication system, and it has an address that's like the homeless shelter. Um, to, there's the Rio Grande address. Right. Or if the address is completely unreal, um, like sometimes they'll just, make, they'll just make up an address and it's on that's what's on the citation. We know it's not collectible as far as um, it, potentially not collectible. We're not going to say somebody isn't going to try to take care of their citations and through Judge, Judge Baxter working through something. but. Those ones, we're pretty much certain that even if we do collect, it's probably not going to be money. It's going to be through community service. And a lot of those will be um, repeat um, incidents, incidences where they've, you know, it's the same person receiving more than one citation. So Claim those uncollectible. We're calling those uncollectible. Right. And that makes sense. Um, I'm just curious what the definition is between open and possible collection. So total number of citations um, is how many were written year to date. How many are still open is 3,300. Mm -hmm. And then below that is that, that those three numbers break in, break down into that 4,000. So 1,000 is we consider potentially uncollectible. 2,000, we don't know. The address is potentially collectible, but we don't know that person's financial situation. Or the address looks real to us, but we don't know for sure. And then the 700 are closed. Now, we I don't have this on here, but we mail out a postcard reminding the person um, of their citation and to please contact us to make, you know, resolution for it. And sometimes they come back as, you know, no longer at this, no longer at this address. So at that point, we don't know the circumstances or how to reach out to them. Yeah, I'm just curious as the definitions, because it seems like if you can use those identific identification tactics, that there would actually be less um, under the open side of things, I guess, um, unless you carry those numbers forward from previous years or or some other component to that, because it seems like if the, maybe the age of the of the citation or something, I, I was just so at this point we um, do carry them. <clears throat> I apologize. We do move them forward. Mm -hmm. We just separated these by the year, so we can slice and dice this in any way, shape, or form and go back to the twenty eighteen. Um, so if you would actually um, add how many are open still in 2018 um, as those close, like even for that matter, this was pulled almost a month ago. Some of those numbers should be off just by a little bit because maybe somebody came in and paid their 2018 citation. It's possible. Yeah. Yeah, so it's an ongoing, a lot of stuff in customer service is daily changing. The numbers change daily depending on the traffic, the customers, um, who's taking care of what all the different processes are a daily daily 
move of an update a daily. Okay. So when do you actually write those uncollectibles off? And, so and stop counting them and just say we're not going to collect anything here. Let's just get we, them off our books. Say we have that information. I don't have. I don't know that off the top of my head. But UTA has a, a policy for that. So we'll get back to you and give you that date. Okay. So. And then let's go to our current initiatives. Now, one thing you don't have up here, and I just want to um, talk quickly on, is... Before you... Oh. Uh, do, do we ever sort of say, look, if you'll take care of half of your things or fourth your things, we'll wipe off the other? Do you, does the hearing officer have some discretion? The hearing officer does have discretion to do that. And once again, and he will... Um, our goal is to satisfy those citations, educate them, and get them to be paying writers. We even have some circumstances. Uh, we even have some circumstances where they can actually put their their forty dollars. So take the class; and they have a, they still owe us forty dollars. They can take that forty dollars and put it on one of our fare pay cards, and use that money as a riding passenger. That's where you'll see those levels of um, numbers kind of a change because the hearing officer does have a discretion on amounts. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah. And we have all that tracked as far as how many are combined, what the write-off was, what the decision was. We track the process all the way through. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for going back. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to um, quickly, we didn't put some of the trending reports up here because they were too little to see. But UTA on our SharePoint page has lots of trending and reporting information about our customer feedback. And we follow every um, step of that process all the way through. Um, so, for example, in 2016, we took about 35,000 comments from, our, from the public. That has decreased to 31,000 in 2018. And then in 2019, at the end of October, we're at 27,000. So we're still trending down a little bit. But, you, um, but what the report and the trend lines would show is as we get feedback from our customers and we can see what problems or concerns they have with our system, we work with those departments to find solutions to address and, and resolve those problems. And then the complaint numbers actually reduce because we're satisfying the customer's um, needs, addressing and educating them on how to use our system. And so the numbers um, decrease that information is available in reporting if you're ever interested in seeing that and it is on available on SharePoint um, We do take customer comments and we track two parts of the data We do track what the customers comment is what they experienced and how they felt about our our service and then after investigation After it's been investigated um, with video point, you know, we're able to pull videos on on the vehicles mm -hmm. to see situations um, we have the investigation side of the report and that dashboard we have will show that but that's the area that after investigation we can really see what UTA's um, big issues are so we can look at them and figure out ways to address them or make sure we're addressing them properly and, and timely so that information is is available also I think it's really important that um, customer service has done a great job working with our operations team in being kind of that voice of the customer and really working with operations to help um, kind of interpret what uh, our customers are seeing um, to the point of here's what they're hearing on the street and this is what is um, kind of affecting our customers and as we're using the data that they're receiving and it's it's really good qualitative data because it's really coming in as a voice right they're able to say here's the trends here's what we're seeing Here's how it's affecting our customer. Now, how can we make this better? And so, as you see, this kind of leads into our current initiatives. Cindy's going to talk about the measure and improve the customer experience through implementing this full circle feedback loop. So a few years ago, customer service was putting all this information out to operations, right? Saying, here's what we're hearing. But then the customer wasn't, or, or customer service wasn't hearing anything back. So one of our initiatives is the feedback loop. How are we getting this back to their team, but also our customers saying, we heard what you said, and then we're putting it back out. And a good example of this was our Project X, the T, T, uh, T yeah, I can't say, if, ugh, I, I stumble, but it was our TVMs. We were having issues. We were having issues on our readers. We had a great team in uh, IMS who put this project together, and we saw the trend huge trend 
on on feedback from our customer and then as we put the project out it oh. came back down and then we got back to our customers a better product so it's that feedback and you can talk about those kind of initiatives moving forward yeah yeah so like she said um information used to be gathered and sent to the different business units and we file every comment feedback and opinion about uta gets filed and and sent through to and documented in our system and what we weren't getting back all the time was what was the problem, what was the solution, and how could we resolve it. Um, we really try to take care of things on when they first call so that it's addressed immediately, but sometimes we don't know the answers, so we have to forward it. And anything that's about an employee behavior needs to be investigated by that supervisor. Um, they need to pull video and different things like that. So what we're looking to do is after the investigations are completed in the business unit, um, reviewing those comments and the resolution, which will help educate the agents in the future to know how to handle the comments, and also, if needed, follow up with the customer so that we can make sure that they feel we have addressed their comment and to make sure we're taking care of, and that we are listening to what they're saying and we are trying to improve our system. And that's that's our goal for that. And we do have measure. We're going to put some measures in place to measure how we're doing now and what it looks like in the future to make sure we're being successful. So we're excited about this. Um, in, in a budget amendment, I think last August or so, um, you know, we approved a couple new positions yes. for your area. And part of the discussion was actually coverage on Sunday. And I just wondered how that's transitioning. And It will be happening. I haven't worked through the final details, uh -huh. but if we have customers that are in our system on Sunday, and they are stranded and can't, you know, can't find their way to our service. We will be able to at least respond to them and tell them where service is at and um, give them information. And if possible, if we if we can possibly transport them, we will. We'll be working with operations, the different operations divisions, to okay. handle that. Okay. So we will um, have that available on Sunday because soon as the the new employees that we got approval will be starting on the 16th of December. Okay. Training six weeks long for just learning our service, and then they'll be trained on um, the specific jobs, and then we they'll start working. And we'll be open on that particular team. The customer communication social media specialist will be seven days a week. Yeah. Okay. So, um, of course, internal and communications, which part of that um, full circle is about, is making sure that as things are happening throughout the company, as long as the customer service employees are informed of what's going on, what the solution is, um, our information and education can help us improve the experience for the customer. And then we can also give the agencies and the departments and the divisions um, communication to help them improve their service um, by giving that feedback from the customer. So making sure we have good communication links and processes for that. Um, and then finally, um, the biggest UTA, I told you guys that we have the two different groups, the customer experience and then the UTA investigation. Right now, our biggest area of feedback is, under after investigation, the employee did per policy procedure what we asked them to do. Okay, so the customer complained about their experience, it was investigated, and our employee did what we asked them to do per our policies and procedures. Um, that number is so high right now. We want to look, and Nicole and I have been um, reviewing some of that stuff. What, if there's that many people having issues with certain policies or procedures, we need to look because maybe we need to change the policy and procedure if it's not meeting the customer need. So that needs to be evaluated to make sure we're considering safety always, the customer, you know, and that operationally we can do that. And, you know, determining, you know, is there any way we can improve the customer experience? The other thing, uh, and it kind of is the flip side to it, I, um, you know, I, I was on a bus ride once and, or I don't know, I think maybe at, or at a luncheon or something and talking to one of the operators and, you know, the schedule's tight and we've done a great job tweaking and probably maximizing every uh, ounce of blood out of the <laughs> timing between stops that the operators felt a little stress like, especially during peak times, you know, if they're not hitting their time things. And it's it's a delicate balance between having people sort of stretch and having reasonableness. 
I'd love to figure out a way that if you have a complaint and the uh, and the employee's done what they're supposed to do, it'd be nice to actually acknowledge the employee for following procedure because sometimes you get this complaint thing and and you you, you make you squirmish the next time you sort of stick mm -hmm. with the complaint. You know, if the policy is the right policy, um, you know, conversely, we should at least acknowledge the employee that they've done what they're supposed to do and. Well, yeah. and it also may be education on our piece, too, to the customer yeah. that these are policies for safety or for a reason. So it's just us digging in a little bit further of what we need to do to help balance that so that the operator doesn't get squeamish because, you know, the customer's educated and, and we can acknowledge them, too. So I think all of those things are internal communications, external communications. What do we need to do better in those pieces? So um, all of that. So. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Yeah, All right, thank you. Great report. Thank you both Cindy and Nicole. We appreciate your efforts there. Um, our final uh, item, although uh, we'll be back for adjournment, is a closed session. And it looks like we'll just have a strategy session to discuss pending or reasonably imminent lo uh, litigation. And we'll be meeting um, in the uh, what do they call that place? Engineers Engineer. cabin. Yes, thank you. And and we'll, we'll gather there to begin the closed session. We'll give folks uh, a five minute break uh, in between. So just uh, uh, in case people need to take a second. Um, I move we uh, move into a closed session. I'll second. I have a motion and a second uh, to go into closed session. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes and we'll uh, gather there in five minutes.
All right, we are back from our closed session and note that our next meeting will be uh, a week from today on December the 11th at 9 a.m. Uh, ask for a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Um, motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We stand adjourned.